So several of you have asked me to say a few more words about our LBO example. So this is what I want to do in this short um, video. So you will remember that the example is described right here in the um, LBO case, which you should, of course, read carefully before uh, you listen to the rest of this uh, video. I'm not going to go into details here, but if you but you should if you're going to get the most uh, out of the example uh, that that you can. OK, so that's where the example is described, but uh, where you find the um, uh, calculations that go with this example is under the DCF file, which is shown right here, but I'm going to go. I'm going to jump right to it here. So let's start from the beginning. What is an LBO? So an LBO is an acquisition that happens to be financed with a high fraction of debt. And more importantly, perhaps it is believed in this acquisition that the use of debt independently is going to create a lot of value, that it is going to make that particular acquisition particularly valuable. If this was a class where we talk a lot about LBO, we would say that basically when you do an LBO, you hope to generate value in two main ways. One is through the use of financing and through the advantages associated with financing and two through so-called operational improvements. So operational improvements are a euphemism. If you're ever on the receiving end of those operational improvements, you'll realize that they can be very painful, but basically cost cutting uh, measures and uh, improvement of the way the business is run and finding better markets for what the business does, et cetera, et cetera. So it's value created by financing and value created by operational improvements. That's what we're looking for in LBO. So when it comes to the value created by financing, you should at this point, having taken my class, have a little bit of skepticism about that because obviously, yes, financing can create value, but we also know that financing can destroy value. But be that as it may, this is not the point of this short video, so I'll stay away from it. The belief is certainly that using a lot of financing is a way to create a lot of value. Okay, so the question that you've asked me, uh, some of you uh, anyway, is how is an LBO exercise different in spirit from any old DCF exercise and why do we consider it to be a different category? And the answer is not very, it is not very different. It's just a matter of um, emphasis, really. So the first point of emphasis, like I said, is supposedly we're trying to create value through financing. So we're going to be much more careful about financing in the context of an LBO exercise than we would in a traditional DCF. As I've told you many times, in a traditional DCF, you're going to work almost always at the unlevered FCFF uh, level, and you're going to let WAC capture any value created by financing. Now, that works, I said many times, really well when financing is stable and uh, when it is not in some sense a big source of uh, cash flows in the course of the exercise. But here when you're doing LBO, since it is mostly or at least largely about financing, we need to be much more careful about financing than we would in a traditional DCF. So we're not going to let WAC do all the, the work. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to work at the FCFE level because when we work at the FCFC level we take the timing of cash flows associated with financing much more seriously so that's one of the key distinguishing features of an LBO exercise the other more minor difference is going to be that we're going to use slightly different metrics than we do in traditional DCF uh, for instance uh, equity multiples are going to be much more common uh, in the context of LBO for reasons that are not fully clear to me, but um, it is what it is. Um, okay, good. So now let, let's go to the numbers associated with our LBO example. Again, I'm not going to go into details. This is a short video, but you should be able to map the text of the case into those numbers very easily. As usual, the text of the case is going to give you your assumptions, and then you're going to turn your assumptions into a pro forma. So, but because, as I said, we're doing an LBO exercise, the first thing you have to do is you have to write out carefully what the debt schedule is going to be. We are going to work at the FCFE level, so I need to know exactly what the debt interest and amortization schedule is going to be. So the first thing you do always in an LBO exercise is you write an entire 
detailed um, that schedule. Next, you start from essentially the same place, which is a computation of EBITDA. Of course, in the DCFs we've done in this class, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into arriving at EBITDA, but here uh, in this LBO case, we're basically given enough assumptions to produce EBITDA immediately. So, um, uh, so, so that's, what we, that's what we do. And then we're going to work our way down to net income, which in traditional DCF, we do not need to do because we go to EBIT and then we go to um, uh, unlevered FCFF using those formulas from our cash flow uh, roadmap. But here we are going to go all the way down to cash flows to equity, to actual cash flows to equity. So it's actually useful to, uh, I don't know, there's other ways to do it, but it's very typical to uh, produce a net income line in an LBO DCF, which is what you see here. Once you have net income, what's missing in terms of arriving at FCFE? Well, all I need to know is my investment, which um, as usual is going to be investments in working capital Capital, which here is the change in working capital, and then capex, if any. And again, the assumptions of the case give you those two lines. And then with uh, all of this, uh, all of these items, you are able to compute FCFE. So if we look at this formula for FCFC, F FCFE, this is basically how you go from net income to FCFE. So the first thing you do is you add back depreciation and you add back depreciation because depreciation is not a cash uh, outlay. It is a deduction that we take into account because we want to calculate taxes and in the United States we are allowed to deduct uh, depreciation before we compute our taxes, which is the only reason why we care about depreciation in finance. But of course, since now we want to go to FCFE, we start by adding it um, back up. And then what else do we do? We take out our investment in working capital. We take out our investment in CapEx. And then if you remember our um, uh, cash flow roadmap from chapter one, what we would want to do here is add, add to this computation any net addition to debt. So, which of course here, what we are doing is we are amortizing the debt, the heavy debt. We're using, I believe, 80% debt to finance the purchase uh, of this company here. So we have a lot of debt and it amortizes over time. So of course, this is something that is going to be taken away uh, before I can compute free cash flows to equity. Very good. So those are free cash flows to equity. And of course, in the final period, as usual, I'm going to have some reversion FCFE. So this is another thing that you're going to see very, very typically in an LBO analysis. You, you're going to see so-called entry multiples and exit multiples. So those are usually almost always EBITDA multiple. So the entry multiples tells you that the acquisition price is for uh, the business. Uh, as in the enterprise, the, the value of all the operating assets associated with the business are going to be 10 times in this particular case, uh, EBITDA over the past year. So you take EBITDA over the past year, which is uh, in this case assumed to be $100 million, you multiply that by 10, that's giving you the enterprise value of the corporation. So that's the market value of the operating assets of the corporation. That's what you have to pay for the operating assets of the corporation. But of course, you also have non-operating assets and non-operating assets in this case are 50 million. So the total purchase price is 1.05 uh, 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 no, it's actually uh, 1.05 billion dollars, uh, if I'm reading my units right. Anyway, it's this number, whatever the proper way to call this is. Uh, okay, so you have, like I said, an entry multiple, but likewise, you have an exit multiple, which tells you that at the end of the exercise, we're going to assume that we're going to sell this particular property for 10 times EBITDA. Remember, I mentioned that in LBO, the other source of value are the so-called operational improvements. So obviously, the idea is I'm going to boost EBITDA, and that means that when I sell the property in uh, a few years, I'm going to sell it for a pretty high market value. And here, this is most evident because we assume an exit multiple, which is the same as the entry multiple, which means that uh, basically the, the selling price is going to be a simple function of the EBITDA that I'll be able to generate by year five in this particular pro forma. So this number 
uh, here, which is reversion FCFC, is, is just going to be 10 times the most recent EBITDA, which is uh, 105 millions and change. But then in addition to this, because this is giving me once again enterprise value, the value of operating asset, I'm also going to sell whatever non-operating assets I still have on my books. There's a long note here about how to treat non-operating assets in an LBO exercise. I'm not going to bore you with it. Suffice it to say that I'm generally not impressed by what's done in practice. I, I would be personally much, much more careful about the treatment of non-operating assets and cash in particular, but it is what it is here. We're making this um, standard assumption that you just carry forward your cash all the way to the end. And at the end, of course, when you sell the asset, you're selling the cash and the value of cash is cash. That's the easiest thing to value. So we get this addition. So what is this minus um, uh, S8 here? This minus S8 is, of course, when you sell the property. Oh, and I've done... I've did something here. What happens? Uh, there is going to be, as usual, a due on sale close, so you have to uh, repay your loan. At least here, there's an assumption of a due on sale uh, clause. Okay, very good. So that gives you your FCFE from operation, your FCFE from disposition. Those are cash flows available for distribution to equity holders. And then what about total FCFE? Well, total FCFE is just the purchase price right here minus. 80% of the, um, uh, uh, pardon me, minus the fact that I'm financing a lot of it. So this guy here, let's see the formula here. It should be uh, the size of the loan that I'm getting, which is 04 minus the acquisition price. So yeah, that, that makes sense. 80% 80, 80 entry debt to value ratio. So 80% of the purchase should be this number here. So this is how much as an equity holder I have to uh, provide at uh, date zero. All right, so these are all my FCFE. By the way, there's another assumption here. We could talk about details forever, which is that this CapEx here, the way I have treated it is 100% equity finance. You would have to wonder, of course, in practice, if I'm going to finance 80% of the acquisition cost, how come I'm not able to finance 80% of this CapEx down the road? And you could play with that hypothesis if you wanted to. That's not a big deal. Okay, great. So we have total FCFE, which enables us to compute the standard metrics that are used in the LBO context. Uh, one of the standard metrics is the obvious one, which is the NPV, given the required rate on equity, which is 15% here by assumption. Uh, but then the two less standard metrics, one is the internal rate of return. As I mentioned, I mean, it depends on who you are, but in capital budgeting, um, people tend to be very careful usually about using internal rates of return for various pathologies that we've talked about in this class. In the LBO context, internal rates of return are very, very common. I, I think I attribute this to the fact that LBO is in the domain often of private equity and uh, that sort of uh, investment world where internal rates of returns are, uh, are a very important metric in practice. And the other uh, metric, which is very common in private equity and is very common, therefore, in the LBO context is the so-called equity multiple. So what's an equity multiple? So this is just you take your equity investment and then you sum up all the cash flows to equity. I'm sorry, those that you're going to get. So you do a simple sum of all the cash flows and then you divide that simple sums, simple sum by um, uh, your uh, equity outflow. So this is saying that basically I'm going to get in total over the next five years, 2.3 times my investment at the equity level. So this is known as the equity multiple, otherwise known as the multiple of invested capital. I'm not a big fan of this multiple because of course it makes zero consideration of the time value of money, which to me as an academic guy feels like a big, big no-no, but in practice, uh, people love their um, equity multiples and therefore you will have to produce them. So that's it. That's all I wanted to say about uh, LBOs. And if you have any questions about all that I have said, or for that matter, if you find issues with my computations here, please write.
uh, to me and I will be happy to um, take those questions.